So welcome to Office Hours, and thank you so much for joining us as part of this task of piecing through the story of how our communities came to be the way that they are, as well as coming to an understanding of what it's going to take in order to improve them, to change them, and to make significant changes together with the community members uh, of all stripes, of all places, in order to build healthy and strong towns. And what I often say is the least interesting but most important topic uh, that we cover at Strong Towns is the question of local government accounting. And this isn't something that I, I say disparagingly, but it's because numbers are challenging, uh, particularly for me, for others like me, where we look at it and it immediately begins to just sort of glaze over. And, and the question of what is it that I'm looking at? What should I be looking at? How do I tell a story from these numbers I really begins to emerge? And so this morning, what I want to do is uh, put a number of questions that have been submitted already uh, to Greg's son. Uh, Greg is a member of our of Strong Towns, and he lives in Colorado, uh, where he uh, works uh, currently for a county government there uh, in Colorado. He's previously worked in North and South Dakota as a county administrator in public works and in other settings. And he has a master's of public administration and has served in local government administration for many years. Uh, Greg is also uh, a distinguished Toastmaster, uh, and uh, maybe this is just a quick way to, for me to plug the fact that every Wednesday, uh, the Strong Towns Toastmasters Club meets at 5 p.m. Pacific time or 8 p.m. Eastern time, and that's been an awesome opportunity uh, where we had Greg come in as a guest speaker to share about his story and his experience. And it's a way for every Wednesday for people to have an opportunity uh, to be able to talk and become more persuasive as they talk about Strong Towns ideas. We always say that Strong Towns ideas are persuasive, but the challenge that we often find is to be persuasive when talking about them. Now, this topic of making sense of local budgets, I think really ties in in a similar way where there is something persuasive in the numbers. Sometimes that persuasive idea is we should not be doing something that's irresponsible. And yet, if it's buried in the numbers and difficult to surface, many people run past those markers, run past those red flags, uh, ignore them because of a lack of, of fluency in what it takes to understand the financial outlook of a community and a perception that if we can just find a way, then surely it must be a, a suitable way, uh, rather than saying we need to find the best way to ensure uh, that our ends meet are being met, uh, that we are able to justify the expenses that we're taking on, as well as the revenues that we're bringing in in order to stay cover today's cost, but also uh, tomorrow's expenses. And so, uh, Greg, I want to just turn it over to you uh, to introduce yourself and just a quick comment before you do that, uh, that if you want to add thoughts or comments or questions in the chat, uh, please do so. I have about six questions uh, in the queue at the at this point, but my thought is if there's a, a burning question that comes in, I would be happy to uh, field that question to Greg, as well as to Edward Erfurt, who is our Director of Community Action. Edward's hoping to join us uh, in a little bit of time, uh, depending on, on his schedule as well. But uh, Greg, maybe just a few thoughts on, on the theme of what is it uh, that we can do to make sense of local budgets? And oh, just make sure to unmute yourself. Um, I just wanted to say right up front that the budgeting process is vital to all functions in local government. It's more or less the Bible with which the local government functions each year. And most of the budgets that a local government passes is based on their fiscal year, which in many cases is a calendar year. Other cases, it's usually like a July through June year. And you just have to know which fiscal year your local government works on. Traditional budgeting in government is separation by funds, which are accounting entities within the local government. So the general fund is the operating fund generally of the government. And it does things like streets and finance and the town clerk, the city manager, the police department all of those general functions of a government. And most of those functions, the main revenue source is a combination of property taxes and sales taxes. It, it does get lots of other different types of revenues, but those are the big ones that, that the general fund sees. One exception to the annual budgeting process is there's there are funds called capital project funds. So if your municipality is 
doing budgeting of a project, like a major street project or something like that, that that budget is approved when they let bids or when they issue contracts. So like when they contract with an engineer, that budget starts with how much money that was said to, to have. When you let bids on a project, you award it to a contractor, that creates a budget. And the capital project fund doesn't follow the calendar year or fiscal year. It just goes from beginning to end. In some of those cases, they can be multi-year projects. Other examples are special revenue funds where the revenue has to be tied to the expenditures that are going out. An example of that might be money that, that a library receives that have to be dedicated to the library. You can have that accounted for in a special revenue fund. Proprietary funds are ones that are the utilities of the government. So the water fund, the sewer fund, the if you have it electrical or gas or anything like that different, governments have different utilities. And then finally, there's trust and agency funds. And very few government, very few local governments have a trust fund, but they can. And a trust fund means that you keep the principal and you can maybe spend the revenue, but that gets into pretty involved stuff. So I want people to focus on the general fund, primarily special revenue and the proprietary funds. One of the things that gets very confusing in government though is oftentimes spending on a program in government crosses departmental lines. Like when, when in, in the Northern part of the, of the hemisphere where you're getting snow a lot of times, the cost of snow removal can have pieces and parts of different budgets in them. And that's why I really like the movement today to things like priority-based budgeting and program-based budgeting, because it pulls things out of the traditional silos of the police department, the street department, those kind of things. And it allows you to cross those over. By doing that, it's easier to communicate to the public how much those programs cost. However, it's a big change for government and a lot of the people working in government don't like making those changes because it's more work. I think what it's really important for is the public needs to say, we wanna be involved in the process. We want to have input in the budget. And by doing that, you can direct it more towards priority-based budgeting or program-based budgeting because that means more to the person looking through the budget. I also encourage that people ask their local government to produce budgets that have more text in them, rather than just having an accounting document with numbers, because the numbers only communicate to the people who put that budget together. They do not communicate what the priorities are of the government itself. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I liked uh, what you said just as we were chatting just before this, that traditional budgeting is very accountable, uh, but also very confusing to most people. And I, yeah. I, I want to highlight on the one hand, the accountability is there. It isn't that, you know, this is some shady business at all, but instead it's just a very, 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 very thorough process that results in a, a lack of what feels like a lack of transparency just by being papered or by um, being overwhelmed <laughs> with the amount of detail uh, that's provided. And and the first question I, I liked, um, I, I dropped it in the chat here, but it's uh, someone said, I'd love to see a free city budgets 101 course. Uh, they This person uh, said that they want to run for office one day and they really feel like it's one of the areas where they need to get up to speed and be able to do that. Now, in the absence of that course at this point, uh, Greg, what would be what would you say are some of uh, the simplest ways to learn how a city budget works? Uh, do you have any resources or tips for us? Most important, I think, is one, get a copy of your local budget. And if it's only an accounting document, talk to somebody in the government who has more insight into how those budgets were put together and encourage them to include text in terms of how many employees are in that budget, uh, what the benefits are, how you divide those different parts of the budget out and how you account for the programs because they are capable of doing that. 
but oftentimes, like I said, that takes a lot more work. And if they haven't done it in the past, there's going to be some reluctance. But if they see from the public that they would like to have that kind of detail, I think most governments want to do what the public wants. Great. And um, Edward, you've joined as well. And maybe, Edward, do you have a thought on, on the theme as well? Of how do you learn how a city budget works? Uh, Edward has worked in a number of different municipal governments. And just want to put that question to you, Edward, if you're available as well. Yeah, it's a really important question. I, I think Greg is absolutely right. You you need to, if you're interested in your city's finances, you need to take the time not to meet with necessarily the elected officials, but you need to meet with the finance director and you need to ask questions. And I, I love Greg's points where um, on all of our budgets and all of our balance sheets that we see, we really need to include all of the relevant information to help us make a decision. That's kind of the simplified way of, of showing this. So if we're making a decision of wh where revenue is going to be used, utilized in the city, being very clear in a city budget of what the vision is, what are the objectives? Uh, I, I think I would challenge a lot of cities in these objectives because usually the very first thing I always see in a budget is that we're going to have a balanced budget. The next thing everybody puts in is that we're going to have um, great customer service. <laughs> But so those are the top two everybody puts in and we all pat ourselves on the back and, and that's it. But going through and describing what that actually means, uh, there, there are some things in the public sector right now that are a little uncomfortable that people don't want to talk about, like benefits for your employee base. I think that's important to be upfront about in these documents, but there's a lot of pushback uh, in, in the sphere now. But identifying that because the um, what, what we're seeing through the community action labs is we get the opportunity to look at a lot of people's budgets. The budget shortfalls, they believe, are a staffing issue. And we're finding that, in fact, that's not where you could cut all the staff at the city and the budget would still be uh, not balanced. So trying to identify some of those pieces and be very descriptive in your goals and objectives as a community because just as I would in a plan, want to show objectives, we want the community more walkable, we want the streets to be calmer, we need to use those same ideas in the budget of what we're talking about. How much do we want to put forward in liabilities? Um, a recent budget I saw uh, in, in Canada, we're working with a municipality, and in their budget, they have a formula that they're allowed to borrow against based off of all their city assets. And it's a nice, warm and fuzzy picture to show that if you take all the assets of the city, um, you could borrow like half of that, borrow against half of that, which would be like you or I going out and buying a house that 60% of our salary would have to go to to fund the mortgage. So they could show that, oh, we're, we're only using 10% of what we're allowed to do and we feel good about it. Uh, that's not a good, that's not a good explanation. What, what is a comfort level that the city has uh, long-term on these liabilities? Defining some of those statements, I think is really important in, in these documents. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I dropped a couple of notes to uh, check out afterwards as well in terms of what even customer service should mean for a city. Chuck did a podcast on that, and I thought that was an excellent question uh, that he posed of, you know, we can aspire to these things, we can have these grand visions, but what what is it that we are committing ourselves to and what resources will we have for that? And then the second one is just uh, a guide for people how to make sense of their own city's budget. I should have included that right at the, out front, or at the outset, but um, I want to go over to Greg. Greg, uh, we talked just before we started here, uh, about your ex experience in Hayes, uh, Kansas, and the work that you were doing with other staff in, in your community and other leaders. And I think it touches on the question that Jean is asking from Greenlee, Arizona. Uh, she said, how can you increase the odds that doing good municipal budgeting gets into the institutional memory? Uh, how does it live past or live uh, after you've left? How does it live on? And, and what are some of the things that we can press for as maybe Strong Towns advocates uh, to help our community uh, to know when they're doing good budgeting versus when they're not? Well, I think a lot of times it's 
how much something gets reinforced. Um, like I heard recently today, in order for people to truly internalize something, they have to hear it seven times. Well, in terms of a budget, that can be a, a very long-term process. But if people see good ideas and that you are making progress in the budgeting process, they will begin to see the advantage of doing it that way. I have been a proponent of a budgeting method called priority-based budgeting for some time now. It takes a lot of work to set up a priority-based budget because you set priorities in your community, ranking them from a very high priority to a rather low priority. And then you determine whether those programs are things that you should continue or not continue. There's some things that are low priority that you've just been doing for the last 30 years because you've just been doing it for the last 30 years. And there's some of those things that need to be dropped away from your budgeting process. And if you do priority-based budgeting well, I think you can communicate how those expenditures are being allocated across the community. And it's something that we really need to strive for in local government is improving the communication. Because as you said earlier, budgeting is highly accountable. There is nothing getting hidden in the budget. It's just that it's designed to not communicate to, to people who are not the in-group. Let me grab this next question, which is, um, what is the most important page in the budget and where do governments hide expenses in the budget? I, I think if, if you, if you're in a government with city management, I think it's important to look at the, the manager's letter to the board explaining what the changes and updates are to the budget. Again, I don't think there's anything that's purposely hidden in a budget. It's just the way it's communicated. A lot of budgets tend to be very siloed. So you have a budget for the police department or the fire department or the street department or finance department. Those are all general fund, general operating budgets. But the way you spend money tends in a lot of cases to cross those budgets from one to the other. And so you can't see in a siloed process how those expenditures cross those budget lines. An example I gave earlier was snow removal. There can be several departments that are involved, actively involved in managing snow removal. But if you only look at the street department, it's going to be hard to pull that out of that budget because it just has things like vehicle maintenance, employee costs, things like that, but it doesn't tell you how much snow removal costs. And I think it's really valuable for governments to take the time to establish these programs and priorities that show the public what some of those big expenditure items are, street maintenance, things like that. Yeah, maybe over to Edward. Uh, do you have a thought on on when you look at a city budget or if you encourage someone from your neighborhood to look at a budget, what's the most important page that you tell them to go to? So I usually dive in and try to find the document that's going to show the revenue coming into the city. So in, in really um, in more elaborate budgets, they'll show you where all the revenue sources are coming in and they may put it all in the one pool or maybe in two or three different locations, but it's really important to understand the revenue coming in and where it's coming from. Uh, I have seen budgets that do strange things and how they calculate revenue. So as Greg's described some of the siloing, they will sometimes do a budget transfer to say that, oh, the um, Publix Works Department is going to pay facilities to repair and fix their building. So you see funny things with that. So I'm always looking at that revenue side to see what's coming in. The second thing I'm looking for is the type of debt the cities are holding on to. Uh, there's uh, way more debt out there. We, we've looked at projects or communities in Colorado. I think we've seen some of those and some are reporting that over 50% of their revenue is being dedicated to debt service. So of all the money coming in for the year, all that's going into debt, uh, just, just to pay down the debt or to service the debt, 
uh, it's not really uh, producing productive uses in the city. So revenue coming in, I'm looking then at the, that debt service, and then I'm looking at some of the operational pieces. And what I'm trying to get to by looking at those three numbers is to figure out if the municipality is actually afloat or if they're in decline. And um, a lot of the budgets, some of the better budgets will show a multi-year spectrum of that. So I usually don't just look at one budget year. I try to look at a couple. If they are governments that are run by city managers, you can see the years that new management has come in and they sometimes tweak some of those numbers and, and graphs. But I, I'm always looking to see if, if the government um, has the revenue coming in to cover the expenses going out. And, and unfortunately, most cities do not mm -hmm. when we really dive into that. Yeah, just here up on the screen, I've put up uh, an image. I just took a couple of screenshots from my own city's uh, budget summary, which the way that you're describing it, I didn't realize was actually something that not every place does. I always thought that every budget came with a budget summary, but um, this was, I think, the seventh page and the eighth page. Uh, but they here is just as an example for those that are watching this. Um, there's here's the expenditures, and then there's here's the revenues, and they're they're always we have a ba balanced budget requirement in our community, and so they have to show a balanced budget, which is why expenditures match the revenues uh, as they have this. And there's also within that seventy two million dollars that they are contributing towards capital projects. The trouble is that the list of what we have left off the table uh, in terms of deferred maintenance, deferred projects, deferred replacements, all of that is is really starting to, to pick up. And it's quite striking that um, I think a lot of communities are really struggling with the fact that their police budgets and fire budgets are creeping up higher even than capital infrastructure. So I would say that our city is, is in a slightly healthier position as I look at it, but yet it's also that reminder, 33% of our budget going towards capital infrastructure, and that's still just scraping the surface of what literally uh, needs to be happening in, in many places in the community. And so um, if, if there's folks in the chat that want to actually drop a description of their own budget or something, uh, if there's a worst offender, uh, maybe that could be part of uh, the chat discussion. Or if you have, uh, if your community is doing a fine job of explaining this, um, the trouble or the challenges is that when it comes to public consultation, it's difficult to know how to answer. So I, I care a lot about this stuff. I work for Strong Towns now, and yet I have a confession to make, which is I didn't fill out my city's budget consultation this year because I just didn't know. Um, Greg, you talked about involving people earlier in the process and having them answer better questions. Uh, what would that look like in a community? What are some of those better questions uh, that a community can be asking its members in order to yield a, a better consultation process? I, I think it's important to identify your goals and objectives in the budget process early on, and the public can be part of establishing those goals and objectives so that the, the people putting the budget together have a little bit more direction that maybe they didn't see before, maybe they just for some reason didn't realize was a priority of some of the public. and. If you can achieve some of those, it's it, it turns out being a better budget because you are actually going in a direction rather than just doing incremental budgeting where we spent this much last year, this is the pay raise for employees, this is the increase in health insurance, and so we're just incrementing it this way. If you can start heading it in a direction of actually achieving some goals and objectives, I think you can show progress over time way better. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, here's a question from Jared that I really like, which is what's the best way of determining whether expenditures in a budget are reasonable for the city or whether the city is doing the right thing with its budget? I think that touches on, on Greg, what you said in terms of priorities, uh, but what are how do you look at a budget and identify maybe some of the red flags that you would throw if you were analyzing what they're doing? That's what I said earlier with, with the siloing of budgets when it comes to the various departments. It's really hard to pull out of those types of budgets what the government is trying to achieve. 
because there are standard line items that are in each one of those budgets. And it's important to have that conversation of why, why is a budget at the level it is and what is trying to be achieved, what programs are being done to make this budget work. As it was mentioned a little bit earlier, like police and fire today oftentimes take up like 50% of the general fund budget. And I don't know if people really pay a lot of attention to that. When you get to things like a street budget, they involve they involve a whole bunch of different budgets, a lot of times across the spectrum. So you can't just look at one budget and see what it costs to maintain your streets. And it helps if you have somebody to walk you through that and explain how those cross over and how they function within the government. Mm -hmm. Again, people aren't trying to hide anything. The budget process itself creates that. And over to you, Edward, because you're you're like you mentioned, you're stepping into yeah. different communities as the community action lab leader. What are you looking for in their city budget? And what are the things that you're encouraging residents to to take note of uh quite closely in, in future years? Yeah. So the uh we're asking the wrong questions if we want to know if we're getting the best value out of the snow removal or out of our fleet vehicles and out of those purchases, because a lot of that, the way that governments have to purchase things and they have to engage in contracts are fixed. So they're going to get whatever comes in the door. And some years those are cheaper and some years they're more expensive. And that's just the, the art of business in government. They don't have the flexibility that we would have in the private sector uh, doing a business, but it's all out on the open. So there's really nothing hidden there. It just occurs at different times throughout the year. Uh, what I really look at and what we've been looking at in a lot of these communities is that looking at the budget growth. So one would assume that the budget revenue would be growing at a rate equivalent to population and equivalent to land area of your community. So if your community is growing in population at 2% a year, you would expect with 2% more people in your town, you're generating 2% two more, 2 more revenue, and you should see that correlation within your budget. That's not what's happening in a lot of communities, so that's kind of a red flag to dive into. The other thing is that if your city is taking on more, what we would describe as liabilities, but they show up in your asset column, meaning that uh, what, what cities do is they will build a new road and they would say that that is an asset to the community. So we just built a $4 million roadway. We're going to increase our assets for the city by $4 million, which is a very skewed way to look at it. And at, again, at Strong Towns, we would see that as a liability to the community, meaning that there's annual maintenance to it. And then at a certain time frame in the future, that would have to be replaced. But I'm also looking at a land area expansion and development expand and development occurring in the city. If we're building strong towns with every phase of new development in your community, you should see an exponential increase in value in property tax and revenue. Mm -hmm. Meaning you're building things in a traditional way that are that's building wealth in your community. What what we're finding and this is across all of North America with our development patterns, as we're building out and as we're approving new developments in our community, we're, we're seeing a reduction in revenue coming in. And at the same time, we're stacking on more liability, meaning we need more police officers, we need more public works directors to go out and, and maintain our facilities. We need more park staff. We need more city staff to process permitting. So on the analysis, all of the um, all the budgets will show you in the graphs percentages. This budget is uh, increased by X percent. There's usually a nice little arrow graphic. Uh, somewhere in your docu budget document, there's usually a population. So it's showing you, you know, that as a city, you want to celebrate that you've increased your population. So that's there. And then... Uh, there's also something with the land area or amount of developments. 
And with all of those, that's kind of a barometer. I think that if I was a citizen and I wanted to see if we're making um, uh, wealth building and good investments within our cities, we should be seeing uh, exponential expansion of our revenues with every development we approve and with every new resident coming into town. And if we're not seeing that, which is a pretty simple calculation to do, just taking your revenue and then dividing it out by your population or taking your revenue by land area. Mm. Those are the things as a citizen you should be looking at because at, at that point, it's not necessarily a budget decision. The budget is a barometer of like what is actually happening. And in those vision documents where your finance director is saying that we're trying to be fiscally responsible and we have certain objectives within our city, that's an area where you can rally with the finance director, not to beat on getting better numbers out of the budget, but to beat on the other departments and other policies at the city that are resulting in a challenge in your mm -hmm. budget. Uh, that's really helpful. And, and I, I appreciate that. And I'm going to, um, kind of bring this right into the next question that came up from uh, Lucas. And to help with this, I want to show what a very small city, I can't remember, I think it's the city of Dryden, Ontario. So a small community, but they brought in, uh, this is a service provided ClearPoint strategy, I think it is. They sell these types of municipal dashboards. And maybe Greg and then Edward, I wondered what your thoughts are on uh, as Lucas frames the question, there's a lot of smaller communities that lack the staff to track the depreciation of assets. Although as I understand it, like from an accounting perspective, it's more of a fixed formula than an actual going out and checking the temperature or the, you know, the wear patterns of a particular section of the road. Like there's, there's ways to do it in, in shortcut version as a proxy of whether something is depreciating over time. But what I was struck by is that this small community, fairly small community has this dashboard and yet what is missing here is there's no mention of how many storm drains do they have. So they say what the age of it is, but not the sheer quantity of them. Uh, cost per paved roads per lane kilometer. Uh, it's helpful to have that information, but if that's only covering five five streets, uh, then you're in you know you're in really good shape if you have a good tax base for it. Versus if you've got a large sprawling community uh, that really varies. And so it's interesting because they're trying to measure, they're trying to provide these. Uh, it was fairly easy to get to on their site, and yet. I struggle with knowing what these things mean and is there an alternative or is there a way uh, to better use things like dashboards, uh, some of the metrics that we're ta talking about there in order to understand how our city's liabilities are increasing over time as, as Newton's second law takes hold and what can we do about that? Uh, Greg, I, I've put a, a large omnibus question to you. So uh, thoughts, please. Make sure to unmute. Well. That's why I was pointing to more than anything program based budgeting or priority based budgeting because it's better at telling a story of what, how you prioritize street maintenance or larger projects like that. Because, um, regardless what your streets are made out of, oftentimes they have similar um, life patterns to them, but the cost of annual maintenance can vary greatly. Like the difference between a concrete street and an asphalt street, asphalt takes a lot of regular maintenance, concrete not so much, but if you look at it over a period of say 50 years, the total expenditures are not that different because when you go to replace a concrete street, it's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to look at that, that it doesn't seem to vary a whole lot from municipality to municipality. Those are comparable costs. And we have to look at how many miles of road the typical community has. Like, uh, I think it's pretty typical for a municipality of 15 to 20,000 people to have 120 miles of roads. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if a lot of people think about that, but that's a lot of miles of roads. And you're on a fairly limited maintenance and improvement budget. And it's become worse today because a few years ago, a lot of communities received 80% matching grants from the, from the federal government to do 
the major streets in their town. And so people could see a lot of projects being done in terms of miles of street, but it was still only affecting about 20% of total streets. Right. And I, I just think those questions need to be asked of the local government, explaining how they determine what streets need to be replaced, what types of maintenance levels are acceptable. Do people in the community want potholes fixed right away? Are there people who are a little more tolerant of it? And it's different all over. In every municipality, people have different tolerance levels. There's some that the minute a pothole appears, even if it's only three, four inches across, they want it fixed right now. Mm. And that becomes a priority in some communities. When it comes to water and wastewater infrastructure systems, it was popular a few years ago to, to build water mains made out of asphalt, con or excuse me, uh, asbestos concrete. Today, there's most cities are trying to get rid of that. Now there isn't a dam, there isn't a danger of getting asbestos in the water because that's the manufacturer of the or the construction type, but they tend to be more brittle than some of the mm -hmm. um, the metal types of pipes or the plastic types of pipes. So a lot of communities are being encouraged to work those out of their system, but it's very expensive when you start replacing water mains and sewer mains. Mm -hmm. A lot of old sewer mains in communities can be clay, vitrified clay. And those are extremely brittle. They break very easily. Whereas the PVC, the plastic pipes are smoother, they flow water better and they last longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of those kind of things need to be looked at when you're talking about maintenance of assets in the community and depreciation really doesn't co cover the cost of those replacement projects because you're not doing them every three or four years, you're doing them in decades, mm -hmm. long periods of time. So if something might be depreciated out at a cost of 50 years ago, that's not the cost of doing that today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what about over to you, Ed? Um, thoughts on ways in which communities can address their um address their community in order to share what the state of the infrastructure load in their community is. Uh, and maybe just a question on, you know, should a community ask, hey, could we get a dashboard like what, you know, these some of these small towns have? Or do you think that there are better solutions? No, I, I think every community needs to do this inventory. Uh, I will tell you that most communities, when you go in, uh, the smaller the community, the harder it is. But you go in, uh, they usually don't know where their pipes are, what the age of pipes are, where the water water valves are. Um, they, they don't have the capacity for that over the years. They just built because they needed to get a pipe out to the next development. Uh, so this dashboard is, I think, is very important for a city to understand what they actually have in the ground and what their actual liabilities are. Uh, but this is a very, this takes... If you were to go out to a city of 10,000 people today, you're talking about four to five years of data now, you know, going out, surveying, uh, camera scoping, very expensive, very long process to do. We need to do it when we can. We need to collect the drawings and we get them. We need to keep that in, in mind. But one, one thing I've never found, and this has come up a couple of times in our community action labs, uh, and Greg, maybe you can attest to this. There is... Um, some sort of belief out there in communities that in their budget, we have set aside the funds that we need to repair and fix this stuff. And there is there is a lot of belief by citizens when I talk to them in community action labs that somewhere in the budget is a line item that a little bit of money is being tucked to every year so that when we need to repair the road, the money is there. I've not found that pot of money in anyone's budget what I actually find is just the opposite is true. Uh, any money that has been collected for long-term maintenance seems to go into a fund that's then borrowed against or taken from to fund other projects uh, because it's so far out on the horizon. There's also, if you're not in, in most states, there's some restrictions about how much money the city can put into reserves. 
So again, as you could imagine, as a local government, uh, it's not a bank, it's a local government. So the, the intent is not to go and stockpile hundreds of millions of dollars, even though that's maybe what your liabilities are for the city, you, you just physically can't do that. Uh, so money gets moved around into capital projects and other pieces. But um, my, my warning is when you do a dashboard like that, you now are aware of what your real liabilities are within your municipality. And they uh, these are staggering numbers that every year become greater and greater with inflation and time. So, but yeah, I, I haven't found a, a stash of money somewhere in the city to for the, the roads that people need to save up. And generally most budgets um, in smaller cities, you're lucky if you set aside enough money to repave or resurface a mile of road a year in your town. Yeah, it's quite something. I mean, that dashboard that I was showing, I was looking at the indicators and each of them were going in the wrong direction. Uh, everyone was either climbing in terms of costs or, you know, aging, uh, that the aging wasn't being, you know, offset by by new um, uh, repairs, replacements, uh, things like that. Uh, let me just pull up the next question here, or we can take one from the chat as well. But I want to, um, oh, this is always a good one. Uh, what are some success stories? So someone wrote, uh, success stories and blueprints are necessary to sway city managers. Are there any smaller cities which have implemented strong towns thinking and are less budget strapped than years ago? Uh, maybe Ed and then uh, Greg. Yeah, I, I actually worked in a jurisdiction here in West Virginia that didn't carry any debt. And how they got to that, uh, there, there are two things that happened in the history of the city. So it's a city of 5,000 people and it's a growing community. Uh, they the, the first thing that happened is in the 80s, the, the one factory in town closed. When it closed, that was the revenue source. And it was the point in that town that when Friday came and it was payday for city staff, for the half dozen city staff members, the city was not going to be able to cut those paychecks. So uh, longtime council members of a small town made an oath to themselves and the community that they wouldn't take on debt unless they had a revenue source to do it. So they became very stingy with their cash and they moved things into um, capital line items and saved for many years so they could find ways to get projects out. So there's a couple of those communities out there. The other thing that happened in the community is that um, in the, the big boom uh, of, of casinos around the country, a casino came to the community that came with sharing of table games. So percentage of what everybody lost in the casino went to the jurisdictions to cover the expenses that a casino would bring to the town. This was kind of a cash cow. This was a golden goose that landed. And immediately all the municipalities took that money that was uh, un very unpredictable and over time actually declined quite a bit but they put that all into operational costs to pay staff. So a lot of communities bloated up with staffing. They hired lots of police. They hired lots of, of people to take care of the roads and the trees and all those sorts of things. Um, community I was in, they used that because they needed to, to up staff for that, but they took several years to get off of that money and they actually moved all that to capital, not operational. So, uh, there are success stories out there of, of communities that are running more on a cash basis. It, so there are communities out there that do that. Getting off of debt is important for cities. There's lots of folks that will tell you they need to take on debt and it's the way to get projects built. I'm highly cautious of that because the revenues to support that are, are so uh, fragile and the projects never seem to bring the return that we think they're going to bring. Um, so yeah, I, I think if I was looking around for cities, I would look for those scrappy cities that have actually had a, a great default. And if they learned as a community, you'll find that they actually aren't carrying that debt. So there are, there are communities out there to look at. For quite a few years now, there's been cities that use a a method of budgeting called pay go. And that means that 
they don't do a project unless they have the revenue to cover that project. And I, that's a very conservative approach to budgeting. It usually ties more than anything to sales tax rather than property tax. But it is a way to control your expenditures and make sure that you're not overspending. My experience is most of the, like for instance, revenue debt, which ties more to the utilities than anything is for replacement of water and sewer lines. And sometimes that revenue debt can be tag tied to sales tax. But um, a lot of times when it comes to streets, there just isn't a good long-term plan and most cities need to adopt those because streets can be horrendously expensive. And as Edward said, if you have a plan in your budget to do a mile of road in the next year and you have 120 miles of roads you're dealing with, it tells you really quickly that the road is gonna last half as long or less than half as long as you're spending on the budget. So it's, you're going to totally have your roads fall apart long before you have the money to replace all of them. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a critical part of waking up or sort of realizing just what, what the challenge is that's facing us. And I think before we get to the top of the hour, I wanna take uh, in two more great questions that have just been submitted. So the first one uh, is uh, maybe, uh, for Greg, what are a couple of questions that people can ask themselves and or city leaders about the hidden costs of new developments like stadiums, big chain stores? Uh, how do we evaluate these types of projects from a financial perspective? I, I think more than anything, as those come to the table, the government needs to ask them how the costs of that new development are going to be covered. Oftentimes in the past, I, I honestly think people were lulled into a sense of confidence that it would that a development would bring more benefit to the community than the liability of that coming to the community. And I think there's been more eye-opening views of that over the last few years in terms of that's not always true. Mm -hmm. And you can't bank on the new development covering coming to cover the cost of the old development that you now have absorbed a bunch of liability on. And that's that's very much a strong town's attitude toward development, but I'm I'm hoping more and more communities see that that is a legitimate complaint that that just having that development come to town doesn't mean that the town is going to become more successful. It could actually turn out being worse. I uh, and. Yeah, I, I think you have to ask those questions about what the real revenue is coming in and then what those real expenses going out to this. Mm -hmm. So um, I we're working with Medicine Hat in the Community Action Lab and they the action team showed a new neighborhood that came into town. It was a little controversial. Uh, I couldn't find it on the map because it looked like it was an extension of the urban uh, perimeter of the town. But in fact, to get to it, you had to cross a creek, which led to two miles of additional roadway to get to that location. One of the questions they didn't ask, or they didn't bring all the people to the table, they forgot to bring the fire marshal to the table when they were doing the, the plan development discussion. So through their development review, the community was being built and the fire chief was not part of the development decision. And the fire chief came midway through this development and basically said, you know, uh, my fire response times to that neighborhood now exceed the six and a half minutes that I'm obligated to provide all of our residents. And the only way I can provide fire service to that is if you build me a $9 million fire station that has a $3 million operating cost per year to service. And we're talking 30 homes. This is not like a, a, a new whole new city. Um, that led to a whole bunch of budget shifts. And frankly, what happened to the city is they ended up giving a grant for those houses to have fire sprinklers installed because the, the, the point of least resistance on this at the last minute was to go and 
put in a system that they could, instead of being at six and a half minutes, it could be like eight and a half or nine minutes response time to the house. So when you're doing these discussions, there's a lot more involved. Cities are very complex. So on those budget decisions, again, with that visioning, making sure that it's not just the finance director making these decisions. Have we looked at it from a growth management side for the planning? Have we looked at it from a policing side? Have we looked at it from a fire response time? Um, it's easy to look at the big ticket items in all your budgets. Those are the first departments I would talk to, police, fire, and public works. Hmm. Um, so making sure those folks are at the table. And again, the visioning document, the city manager's letter in the beginning of those budgets or the or the finance director, whoever's putting together, uh, you could tell right away whether or not they get along with everybody in the city because they should have all of them included in that letter. Um, so if a specific development is coming in, we can be a lot more direct. How does this impact police? How does this impact fire? How does this impact our road inventory? Um, and the finance director will tell you what the tax revenue generation possibly could be, because we could look at another grocery store and figure out what that would be. And again, is this new development, the simple question, is it going to generate more revenue than what it's going to take to manage it from a city perspective? Mm -hmm. And I think even as you mentioned, you know, contacting these departments within the city, one of the things to also consider doing as if you're a regular resident uh, like I am, I will write an email to my city councillors and I'll say, hey, I'm a resident, I'm a, I'm a renter in, an, in the community, I really care about this place and I have some questions, um, can you follow up for me? And when I worked in the mayor's office, we fielded questions like that all the time and we got answers faster than whenever people you know, contacted the department quick uh, directly. And so sometimes it works if it's on an advocacy side, go through the elected officials uh, because they should be working in a sense, working for you or, you know, following those things up in part, if you can frame it as this is something that we all should know together. Uh, none of us should be flying blind. And that allows a lot of counselors. They hate being, you know, caught off guard by things uh, because the newspapers come after them or the bloggers or whatever, or Twitter mob, uh, whatever that looks like. And so you can actually help them by alerting them to things unless you come at it in a, in a really cranky way. Um, I, I just got an email from somebody who accused me of being a coward because I hadn't respond to his, uh, responded to his email after two days of it being in, or no, a day and a half of it being in my inbox. Don't be like that. Um, that does not win you any friends or influence people. Um, last question, a uh, great question from Gene, and then we're going to wrap up at the top of the hour here. Uh, but this is uh, just for Greg. You talked about priority-based versus traditional budgeting. Can you help just what are the hallmark or what are the markers of the two and how can you tell what your community is using? Uh, looking at graphs and things like that? Generally, you're going to see traditional budgeting. If you look at a general fund budget and you see the traditional departments of finance and police, fire, streets, parks, those types of things, those tend to be traditional budgeting departments. But it's important through a like programs like priority-based budgeting or other program-based budgeting that they draw lines across those departments when necessary to identify what the cost of a program is. And by programs, I think are far more easy to communicate what the costs of government are than trying to pull them out of the traditional departmental budgets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. And uh, Gene, I did find something uh, that's a much deeper dive if you want uh, on it, but uh, I suspect that uh, Greg's answer has been quite helpful. So um, thank you both to Edward, as well as to Greg, as well as for the great questions in the chat and uh, the discussion. I'm glad that we could have this, dis uh, this topic uh, covered today. I know it's getting in the weeds or getting into the numbers. And that's always something that uh, even as I was prepping for this, I was a little bit worried, like, would I even understand what the conversation was? Uh, but I think we've had a great enlightening uh, discussion. So thank you all for uh, being part of Office Hours today.